on World News Tonight. Mutated variant. Just after a slight ray of hope, a new COVID variant has emerged. Tragedy continues. UK vow action after deadliest channel migrant tragedy. New leadership. Interpol elects a general accused of torture as new president. Home for all. Furry friends find their forever homes for the holidays. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with the COVID pandemic. A heavily mutated coronavirus variant has been found in South Africa. It is still unknown whether it is more transmissible or severe than other variants or whether it can evade vaccines. But Britain has already introduced travel restrictions for South Africa and neighbouring countries. The WHO will hold a meeting to discuss the matter. The UK on Thursday banned flights from six southern African countries due to a new coronavirus variant spreading there. The new variant, called B11529, has alarmed global health officials as it appears to be more transmissible and may evade vaccines. That's because its spike protein is dramatically different to the one in the original coronavirus that the COVID-19 vaccines are based on. Britain's health secretary said it was important to act fast. We will be suspending all flights from six southern African countries and we were adding those countries to the travel red list. Those countries are South Africa, Namibia, Lesotho, Eswatini and Zimbabwe and Botswana. And we will be uh, requiring anyone that arrives from those countries uh, from 4am uh, on Sunday to quarantine in hotels. Our scientists uh, are, are deeply concerned uh, about this variant. I'm concerned, uh, of course, and that's one of the reasons we've taken this action today. Earlier on Thursday, South African scientists said they had detected the new COVID-19 variant in small numbers and were working to understand its potential implications. The variant has also been found in Botswana and Hong Kong, but the UK Health Security Agency said no cases of it have been detected in Britain. The World Health Organization is holding an emergency meeting on Friday to discuss the new variant. A surge in COVID-19 infections in Germany is weighing on consumer morale in Europe's largest economy, dampening business prospects in the Christmas shopping season and threatening to kick away the country's last remaining pillar of growth. Consumer morale in Germany is weighed down by a surge in infections. That's according to market researchers the GFK Institute Thursday. The group's closely watched consumer sentiment index fell to minus 1.6 points heading into December, down from exactly one a month before. The December reading is the lowest since June and may dampen business hopes for the Christmas shopping season. GFK researcher Rolf Berkel. There are the current restrictions. Many people will now be afraid again to go shopping as they worry about getting infected. And as a lot of the Christmas markets have now been cancelled, the buzz is now missing from the city centres, which is bad news for high street shops. A rise in new infections over the past few weeks could kick away Germany's last driver of growth in the final quarter of the year. And the health crisis is not the only point of concern for GFK. Inflation is another problem. On the other hand, we are experiencing price hikes and rising inflation, which is currently above 4%. And these two things together are really pinching the consumer sector at the moment. The survey was released before detailed GDP data, which showed Germany grew 1.7% in the third quarter, below initial readings. The GFK Institute's index also found more gloomy data for Europe's largest economy. Consumer expectations for their personal income and the economy's development have dropped, and the customer will to buy was at a nine-month low. As the Thanksgiving holidays approach in the United States, Americans pace to get their booster jabs in order to have a comfortable union with their loved ones. 
Americans got their COVID-19 booster shots at a near record pace in the lead up to the Thanksgiving holiday after the Biden administration expanded eligibility last week. Just over 6 million people got an additional dose of one of the three approved COVID-19 vaccines last week. Data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention shows that's the highest weekly total since boosters were first authorized and an increase of over 15% from the previous week. Health officials, however, are still concerned about climbing infection rates ahead of the winter holiday season as colder temperatures drive people indoors and families travel to spend time together. After about two months of declining infections, the United States has reported daily increase for the past two weeks, and there are concerns the U.S. could follow a fresh outbreak in Europe. U.S. regulators expanded eligibility for vaccine booster shots to all adults allowing millions more Americans to get additional protection at least six months after the second dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech or Moderna vaccines, or two months after receiving Johnson & Johnson's one-dose vaccine. Regulators backed the additional doses out of concerns over data showing immunity generated by the first shots wanes over time. We have some good news for you. The Pfizer and BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine gets the green light to be administered for children of ages 5 to 11. The European Union's drug regulator approved the use of Pfizer-BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine for children between the ages of 5 and 11 on Thursday. The green light comes as Europe is again the epicentre of the pandemic, accounting for about half of cases and deaths. Inoculating teenagers and children could be a critical step towards taming the global health crisis. In Germany and the Netherlands, kids now account for the majority of cases. The European Medicines Agency, or EMA, recommended that children should be given the injection in two 10-microgram doses, three weeks apart. Adult doses are 30 micrograms. However, countries will not be able to start rolling out shots for younger children until next month. According to a spokesperson for BioNTech, the first of the low-dose pediatric version will be delivered on December 20th. While final approval is up to the European Commission, it typically follows EMA recommendations. An EU source told that a decision would likely come on Friday. The bloc joins a growing number of countries, including United States, Canada, Israel, China and Saudi Arabia, to clear vaccines for children in the 5 to 11 year age group and younger. And then on, on the really high risk and vulnerable groups. The World Health Organization said on Wednesday that as children and adolescents are at lower risk of severe COVID-19, countries should prioritize adults and sharing doses with the COVAX program which supplies vaccine for the world's poorest countries. A U.S. bid to tame oil prices with a coordinated release of oil reserves have drawn a non-committal response from China as focus shift to OPEC plus response, leaving markets unconvinced about Washington's plan. The U.S. is set to auction off 50 million barrels of oil from its reserves. That is part of coordinated action with other countries, including India and Japan which Washington hopes will help cool soaring prices for crude. But it's not quite clear how much China is willing to help, and as the world's largest importer of oil, that matters. On Thursday, Beijing wouldn't add to earlier comments that it would release reserves according to its needs. Oil producers group OPEC also seems unmoved. It's sticking firmly to plans for only a modest increase in output. That's all left markets unconvinced about the U.S. move. On Thursday, international benchmark Brent crude was broadly steady. One analyst told that traders believe more in OPEC's ability to keep supply tight than the U.S. ability to have an impact. Goldman Sachs called the oil volumes in the U.S. plan a drop in the ocean. Now OPEC and allies will meet on December 2nd to discuss policy but prospects for any change seem slim. Strategists at the group are worried about a possible new dip in demand amid resurgent health worries, and think the US move could just swell an oil surplus. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news.
Welcome back. Global Police Agency Interpol elected Emirati Inspector General Ahmed Nasser Al Raizi as its president despite accusations from rights groups that he failed to act on allegations of torture of detainees in the United Arab Emirates. In the end, the accusations against him didn't make a difference. Ahmed Nasser Al Raizi has been elected president of Interpol with 69% of the votes cast by member countries of the International Policing Agency. Several complaints of torture and arbitrary detention have been filed against the general, who's head of the United Arab Emirates Security Forces. Among his accusers are two British citizens. On Monday, they arrived in Istanbul, where Interpol's General Assembly has been taking place. How can somebody like General al Raisi, who is in charge as the Inspector General of prisons and the guards and the interrogators, how can somebody like that become head of Interpol? Another allegation was filed in France in June. It says Raisi is responsible for the torture of Emirati activist Ahmed Mansour, keeping him in a four-square-metre cell for the last four years. Last month, 19 NGOs expressed concern about Raisi's candidature, describing him as part of a security apparatus that systematically targets peaceful critics. The UAE has invested significantly in Interpol over the last few years. In 2017, it donated almost as much as the required contributions of all 195 member countries put together. Britain and France were looking at new measures to limit migration across the channel and break people smuggling networks after at least 27 migrants trying to reach England round off the northern French coast. The capsizing of the migrant boat in the English Channel is the deadliest tragedy there for years. But hours later, hundreds of migrants were set to make the same crossing in dinghy boats to reach the UK. Their journey has lasted many months, several years in some cases. This crossing, however dangerous, is seen as the final effort before they can start their new lives. But weather conditions are bad, so people come to this site near Calais to get aid, like food and blankets. Uh, we crossed Libya. Libya and Algeria, and then went to Spain by sea before I reached France. We're used to facing death in Syria and other Arab countries. We'll continue our quest despite the risks. We're not afraid, because we've faced far worse. It's 34 kilometers. Our journey until here was so much longer. Abdel tried to cross the channel on Wednesday too, but was taken by rescue ships. Smugglers are known to organize crossings, demanding a minimum of 3,000 euros from each migrant. But Abdel denies he has used smugglers to cross the sea. They all say the UK is their final destination, with the idea that they would be able to find work there more easily. Some with the aim to send money to their families back home. Thousands of Sudanese continue to protest, keeping up the pressure on military leaders after they struck a deal to bring back civilian Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdak, disposed in a coup one month ago. Political prisoners in Sudan will be released in the next couple of days. That message coming from recently reinstated Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdak. His government was toppled in a military coup last month, but he was returned to office under an agreement signed on Sunday. The first point in this agreement is to release political prisoners. I can say that these jailed comrades, whether in the cabinet or in any other positions, will be released very soon, today or tomorrow. But Hamdok faces a battle to win support from civilian groups and convince them that he can act independently of the military. Pro-democracy groups have continued their protest against the military takeover. Medics aligned with protest groups say dozens have been killed in increasingly violent crackdowns. Hamdok said the right to peaceful protest has been earned by the Sudanese people over decades of struggle. We talked very seriously with the security bodies in order not to resist these protests. 
For sure, this is the biggest test for this agreement, to protect the peacefulness of these protests. If it does not happen, it is not in favour of the agreement. We will be keen to achieve this and we will do it. Hemdok is due to name a cabinet of technocrats and said any appointments or dismissals made since the coup would be reviewed. As long as he is Prime Minister, Hamdok said he would protect the executive from interference, adding that if I can't, I will go. At least 22 people are dead following an accident in a coal mine in Siberia, including three rescuers who were sent down as part of the rescue efforts. The country's emergency ministry feared that there could be further casualties. At least 52 people were killed in an accident at a coal mine in Siberia on Thursday. Russian news agencies reported that six rescuers who went down to save men from a gas leak were among the dead. The regional investigative committee said three people, including the director of the mine and his deputy, had been arrested on suspicion of violating industrial safety rules. It said miners had suffocated when a ventilation shaft became filled with gas. Nearly 300 people were inside at the time, according to authorities, who say only 239 got out. Dozens of people were being treated at a hospital. Several remain in critical condition. State television said prosecutors believed there had been a methane explosion. The Kremlin said President Vladimir Putin had ordered the emergency's minister to fly out to the Kimarovo region to help with the operation. Kimarovo, over 2,000 miles east of Moscow, has suffered fatal mining accidents for years. Australia rushed peacekeepers to the Solomon Islands, hoping to quell riots that threatened to topple the Pacific nation's government and left its capital ablaze. After a second day of widespread protests, the looting in Honiara, the Prime Minister called the neighbouring Australia for help. Defying a lockdown, protesters took to the streets of Honiara to condemn the government. Authorities imposed a 36-hour shutdown to tackle the unrest. Protests continued a day after demonstrators tried to storm parliament and topple Prime Minister Manasseh Sogavare. Now at the request of his Solomon Islands counterpart, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison says he will send security forces to assist with riot control. Our purpose here is to provide stability and security to enable the normal constitutional processes within the Solomon Islands to be able to deal with the various issues that have arisen. Morrison says the Australian deployment will last a few weeks. Canberra's last peacekeeping mission to the islands was in 2003. It went on for 14 years. The two countries signed a security treaty in 2017. At the heart of this latest disturbance, broken infrastructure promises made by the Prime Minister. Demonstrators are calling for Sogavari's resignation. Another grievance, a government decision to switch diplomatic ties from Taiwan to China. Honiara's Chinatown has been targeted during protests. Several buildings have been set ablaze and stores looted. Beijing's embassy has called on the Solomon Islands government to step up protection for Chinese businesses. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The 13th Asia-Europe meeting aimed at deepening political and economic cooperation among its members kicked off in Cambodia. Leaders from Asia and Europe are discussing global issues such as climate change and COVID-19 during the two-day conference. Uber drivers block central Brussels, protesting against a court ruling which will see their activities stop in the Belgian capital. At least eight people were killed in Somalia's capital Mogadishu when Islamist militants launched a suicide attack on a UN security convoy using a vehicle laden with explosives. Thousands of women across Latin America demonstrated in streets of major cities to demand their government to put an end to gender-based violence. The European Union aims to halt air travel from the South African region amidst rising concerns about a new COVID-19 variant detected in South Africa. And finally tonight, a shelter in Virginia is allowing people to foster animals during the holidays, alleviating the loneliness that some may feel this time of the year. Some of the cats and dogs are finding their forever homes. Andy and Jennifer Parsons didn't think their hearts could handle a new dog. They lost the one they've had for 13 years 
just last month. But they heard the Richmond Animal Shelter lets people foster a pet for two weeks during Thanksgiving. Shelter director Christy Chips Peters tries to find a temporary home for these abandoned cats and dogs. I was thinking about how full our shelter was of all of these animals that just wanted to be loved. And thinking about the people out there that may be alone for Thanksgiving that want the same thing. And so if we could connect the two, maybe it would be a really beautiful thing. She matched the Parsons up with a two-year-old pit bull named Squirmy. I love her so much. I'm so glad that she's with you. More than half the time, foster parents end up adopting, and that's exactly what the Parsons did. And now they know their hearts still have plenty of room left to share. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again on Monday with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a great weekend.